Hello there, Philip. So you asked a question about icebreakers, all right? And I guess I'm gonna extrapolate my answer in terms of how did I manage that group in uh, in Mackay and the QTAC conference? So, uh, um, because they kind of tie in together. So let's address the icebreaker uh, question first of all. For me, an icebreaker has the purpose of the following. Essentially, it is bridging people to feel comfortable with each other. And the second part of it is getting people into the learning headspace and also getting comfortable with the topic. The icebreaker that you described to me about the rope, I've got no issues with it. It's a great icebreaker. My only concern about it though, is it could eat up a good chunk of your time in terms of training that you like training time that you've got available. So I guess my advice on that would be just make sure that you're going to say allocate 15 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes for the icebreaker, so to speak. The other challenge that you may face is that we need to remember the purpose of an icebreaker is to get other people to feel comfortable with each other. Now, if I haven't met someone uh, before the um, before the icebreaker that we're about to go into, I might feel a little bit hesitant to work with someone. So you just need to keep that in mind. Now, you could go onto Google and uh, you could find all different books on icebreakers, right? Um, one of my favorite ones is definitely a pack of cards um, or images. And so, for example, if I was teaching the topic of leadership, right, um, I would show or make available in front of everyone like 20 images or 30 images and people would pick out a card and say, yes, this represents good leadership to me because blah, 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 right? And it becomes a talking point or something that stimulates um, discussion in the entire group, or it could just be in pairs, right? You can get as creative as you want to be with icebreakers, right? But you need to step back and think, all right, what's the purpose of it? So the icebreaker that you described with the rope, it's a great one, but I may just take a step back from that first, and I may suggest that you do a get to know activity first and then you go into the rope activity okay because for me I want to feel comfortable as a learner before I'm pushed outside my um, comfort zone so to speak so I really like to do with, with icebreakers I really like to do get to know you activities first of all now they are not go and meet someone and find out something interesting about that person Hopefully you saw the distinction of what I did at the QTAC conference where I said, go and meet someone and find out what are they passionate about learning about and why do they really enjoy learning about that thing, so to speak, right? It was not about um, necessarily finding about, uh, about, you know, what's interesting for the other person. It had a learning objective behind it, which was get people into the growth mindset, so to speak, right? So it was a bit of a covert get to know you, but also planting the seed for the growth mindset activity that we're about to go into, right? So for example, if I was teaching first aid, a get to know you activity might be go and meet someone and go and find out about what is the uh, most adventurous thing that they've ever done. That could be one thing. Another thing could be um, go and meet someone and go and find out what is the coolest thing that they've ever seen someone else do in terms of first aid, okay? Um, it could be uh, go and meet someone and go and find out uh, what is the, um, I guess, the most recent injury that someone has had. Now, I'm being very careful when I'm picking these because I don't want to pick something that's going to go too morbid or too negative, right? But ideally, I want to pick something that's going to relate to the topic that we're about to go into. So I go and meet someone, find out what they'll find out their name, and find out blah thing, okay, is going to be a starting point for the topic. Now, for example, if I'm teaching the TAE, one of the things I'll do is I'll say, go and meet someone, find out what they do for work, 
and find out what was the best <coughs> excuse me, learning experience in their life. Now, again, the reason I do that is not because I care, but because by them actually sharing with their partner and also with me, I'm going to find out <coughs> excuse me, what was or what is their best learning style. Okay, so for example, hopefully you're following along with what I'm sharing here. If somebody says, well, my best learning experience was when I learned to drive a car with my father and, um, you know, he was very kind to me, and um, he, but he challenged me and it was very motivating. Okay, so when I actually hear that information from a learner, I can actually make a mental note of that and actually write that down. And that's going to give me some indication as to what's important for that learner as I deliver my session, right? So if you can create these kind of strategic get to know you questions that kind of relate to the topic, and then when people share with the entire group, you can be making a note of that and you can use that to your strategic advantage as you're teaching, okay? You can also use it to contextualize your lesson, of course. All right, we always know that it's a common sense thing, right? Cool. So that's kind of icebreakers, right? So any kind of activity like the the rope activity or, you know, I've heard of things where people use toilet paper or, you know, marshmallows and, you know, chopsticks and different things like that. It's great. It's a great learning activity, but I wouldn't necessarily call it an icebreaker, all right? Because as I said, the purpose of an icebreaker is for people to feel comfortable with each other and to bridge into the topic. If somebody threw me into an activity like the rope thing, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, freak out, freak out, freak out, right? And you are going to get people in your group that are more shy, so to speak, and don't like to fall into those activities too soon. Okay, next thing, managing large groups, managing large groups like I did at QTAP. Uh, so there's a couple of mindset things that we always need to have a hold on if we're going to successfully manage a group as large as I did. Now, I certainly um, could have done it better. I could have done it differently. What I did wasn't perfect. But there's a couple of things that I did or that I made a point of doing. Number one, repeat things. I made sure that I constantly repeated things. And I really want to make sure that everybody hears my instructions, all right? So I'm going to repeat things a number of times in a number of different ways, okay? So repeat things, repeat things, repeat things. So if you're writing them, writing notes, definitely write that down, repeat things, right? Second thing that I have in my mind as a belief is that I do not move on until everybody has complied. I do not move on until everybody has complied. I'll say it again. I do not move on until everybody has complied. What I mean by that is there is an assumption in my mind that although we are a group of, or we were a group of say 80 um, or you know, 60, 70, 80, however many we had in the room, that ultimately we don't move on until everybody has complied and everybody's followed the directions and everybody's ready to learn, if that makes sense, right? Because I see the 80 as one and everybody needs to be on the same page in order for us to move forward. Does that kind of make sense? And when you adopt that belief, then like you give the instructions, but you're still waiting for people to fall in line, so to speak. Of course you wouldn't move on. That'd, that'd be weird, right? So you kind of set up a social expectation that everybody is going to move along at the same pace. Okay. Now, next thing, one of the really important tactics is command tonality. Command tonality, command tonality. What I mean by that is I didn't raise my voice at all during the uh, workshop. But what I did do is I lowered my voice quite a bit and the command tonality dropping at the end of the sentence that I had gave me the presence and the ability to control the room, okay? Where trainers fall down, and Dan did it occasionally without knowing it, right? He raised his voice, right? 
what you need to do, and I'm not batting down, I'm just saying that you've got to have um, control around your, your vocal delivery if you want to keep your voice for a long period of time, right? And if you want to control a large room. The other thing is um, he had different, he had the parallel conversations happen and he didn't understand why. And sometimes there was complaints about parallel conversations. Well, how do you fix that? Well, command tonality brings people back into attention for you in the room. And you can really do that quite easily just by changing your voice. And also, if you have parallel conversations happening, you just don't continue until those conversations stop, if that makes sense, right? So the other thing is that I was always looking to create change, create change, create change, create change as often as I could, right? There were times where I didn't actually know what I was about to do next, but I always knew that whatever I did had to be different to the last thing. Whatever I did had to be different to the last thing I did, okay? So for example, like if I got people working in groups, I wanted to then make the next activity, whatever it was, had to be different to the last, right? So maybe that was working with a different group member. Maybe it was a different size group. Maybe it was working individually, whatever it was, right? It just had to be different. Okay, so just to recap so far, we got number one is, uh, what did I say? Uh, repeating things. Number two is, command tonality all right number three is creating change as often as i could and the other part of it is not moving on until everybody has complied not moving on until everybody has complied okay and it's kind of setting up social constructs all right and it's all part of me or you owning the room I'll say it again, you own the room you own the room right so one of the tips that i often give people is as weird as it might sound as like esoteric as it may sound you want to be and this is something i did do on the morning of the first day you want to go around as weird as it is you want to go around and actually touch every piece of furniture in the room because by actually touching every piece of furniture you are essentially energetically owning the room now, a lot of times people get nervous um, in you know, presenting in front of large groups, but when you can esoterically and energetically own the room, it becomes part of who you are and you become part of the room and you have a very different presence around you, okay? So something that my mentor once told me is go and touch the chairs, go and touch the tables and go and touch the walls, right? Because it'll give you a feel of strong ownership around the room and it also give you a strong sense of safety. A lot of times we get nervous because we feel unfamiliar in the environment and also we feel like you know we just don't belong or we feel like an imposter whatever it might be okay so just to recap icebreakers definitely do them but also build in get to know you activities okay and also make sure that any activities that you do do um do definitely um relate to the topic in some way shape or form okay Next, how to control large groups. Number one, repeat things. Number two, do not move along until everybody has complied. Third thing, um, command tonality and really own the room. And last of all, as I said, um, go around and touch the furniture and have a strong sense of ownership around the space that you have. And you're gonna find that your presence will really magnify, okay? Hopefully that was helpful. I know it will be. If you implement it, you will get a great result. If you don't, you may continue getting the same result. All right? That's how I end all my videos. Um, if you want to get different results in your life, you need to experiment and see um, how things play out for you. Uh, that group, uh, or just a side note, that group at QTAD, um, I also have a belief going in that everybody and every learner is going to love what I do. Okay. You could, how you choose, or how do I put this? The expectations that you have around your learners will really shape what you define as possible. Now, let me just end on this note. I had a lot of different ideas and different things that I was going to do with that group. And I, um, when I shared those ideas with some people, 
they actually said, no, nah, that would have worked. No, 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 there's no way that would work. No, 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 you're crazy. But two things. Number one, they'd never seen me in action. And number two, they had some preconceived ideas about what was possible for those learners. But what we need to be very careful about is that when you walk into a training group with preconceived fixed ideas, you may limit what's actually possible. All right? So uh, essentially when I walk in, I have a belief that I, with deep rapport and with academic justification, I can get all learners to do anything under my command. It may sound weird, but ultimately, if I walk in with that belief, I can create magic in a training room, okay? But if I walk in and go, ah, there's no way that I could get people to stand up, all right? Well, there's no way I could get people to work with each other. There's no way, right? That creates blinders and blockages for myself uh, for what I can actually achieve in the training room. And I say that authentically because I know you kind of get that um, mindset stuff that we create our own reality based on the perceptions that we hold um, prior to actually um, delivering a training session. Okay, so if you got something from the value, hope, sorry, well, speaking terrible English, hope you got something from the video, hope it's made sense. If you've got any questions, um, just let me know. I will upload this video to YouTube and uh, feel free to watch it a few times. And if you've got any questions, just let me know. Um, but on that note, uh, good luck with your continued training, your experimentation, and um, I'll see you on our next mentor call. Bye for now.